The Seeing Nature, Volume 2, Chapter 1, Sutra. Ananda, you have told me that you saw my fist a bright light. How did it take the form of a fist? How did the fist become bright? By what means could you see it? Ananda replied, the body of the Buddha is born of purity and cleanness, and therefore it assumes the color of a jambu river gold with deep red hues. Hence, it shone as brilliant and dazzling as the precious mountain. It was actually my eyes that saw the Buddha bend his five-wheeled fingers to form a fist which was shown to all of us. Commentary. The Buddha called again to Ananda. Ananda, have you told, you have told me that you saw my fist of bright light. How did it take the form of a fist? How did the fist become bright? Tell me why my fist had light. By what means could you see it? What did you use to see it? Ananda replied, the body of the Buddha is born of purity and cleanness and Therefore, it assumes the color of Jambu River gold with the deep red hues. Hence, it is shown as brilliant and dazzling as a precious mountain. The Buddha's entire body is the color of Jambu River gold. The Jambu River is located in southern Jambu Vipa. The gold found in this river has a slightly reddish cast to it. In southern Jambu Vipa, there is a species of tree called the jambu, and it is perhaps the stems of its leaves which turn to gold when they fall into the water. This kind of gold is much heavier than ordinary gold, and the Buddha's body is likened to it, like the color of jambu river gold. The color of the Buddha's body is a combination of gold and red. A body with that kind of appearance is produced from purity and therefore has light. The light exists because of that purity. It was actually my eyes that saw. Ananda says, I really used my eyes to see it. The five-wheeled fingers were clenched as they were shown to pupil and that is what made the appearance of a feast. Sutra the Buddha told Ananda, Today the Tathagata will tell you truly that all those with wisdom are able to achieve enlightenment through the use of examples. Commentary The Buddha told Ananda, Today the Tathagata will tell you truly. Now I am going to tell you the absolute truth. Are you listening? All those with wisdom are able to achieve enlightenment through the use of examples. People who are wise like to use examples in order to attain enlightenment because if you really have wisdom, you will understand 10 things when you are told one thing. I say something one way and you deduce perhaps 10 or 100 things from it. That is to have a genuine wisdom. Here, those with wisdom does not mean people with genuine wisdom. So, but people with ordinary wisdom which is neither superior nor inferior. Such people can become enlightened through the use of analogies. But if stupid people who lack wisdom are given an analogy, they don't understand and they say, what does that mean? Seeing is the mind. Sutra Ananda, take for example my fist. If I didn't have a hand, I couldn't make a fist. If you didn't have eyes, you couldn't see. If you apply the example of my fist to the case of your eyes, is the idea the same? Commentary Ananda Take for example my fist. If I didn't have a hand, I couldn't make a fist. By the same token, if you didn't have eyes, you couldn't see. If you apply the example of my fist to the case of your eyes, is the idea the same? Are we talking about the same thing or not? The Buddha asks Ananda. Sutra, Ananda said, Yes, world or not one, since I can't see without my eyes. If one applies the example of the Buddha's feast to the case of your eyes, the idea is the same. 
commentary, Ananda didn't take time to cogitate over it. He isn't thinking now. Ananda said, Yes, won't honored one. Since I can't see without my eyes, if one applies this example, the example of the Buddha's feast, to the case of your eyes, the idea is the same. Yes, Buddha. If you compare these two cases, the idea is the same. Sutra The Buddha said to Ananda, You say it is the same, but that is not right. Why? If a person has no hand, his fist is gone forever, but one who is without eyes is not entirely devoid of sight. Commentary Here the Buddha criticizes Ananda, telling him his idea is incorrect. The Buddha said to Ananda, You say it is the same, but that is not right. You say the example of the same in both cases. No. Why? If a person has no hand, his fist is gone forever. If someone doesn't have a hand, he doesn't have a fist either. But one who is without eyes is not entirely devoid of sight. But with someone else who has no eyes, it is not the case that he cannot see anything. He can see. People without eyes can see. Do you believe that? Sutra, for what reason? Try consulting a blind man on the street. What do you see? Any blind man will certainly answer. Now I see only black in front of my eyes. Nothing else meets my gaze. Commentary, for what reason? Why do I say that? Try consulting a blind man on the street. What do you see? Go out to the market and ask the blind man what he sees. Any blind man will certainly answer. Now I see only black in front of my eyes. Nothing else meets my gaze. He'll say that he doesn't see anything but blackness. Sutra, the meaning is apparent. If he sees blackness in front of him, how would his seeing be considered lost? Commentary, the meaning is apparent. If you get the idea, if you Take a look at what it means if he sees blackness in front of him. How could his seeing be considered lost if you see blackness before you? Your ability to see is not lost. It neither increases nor decreases. Sutra, Ananda said, The only thing blind people see in front of their eyes is blackness. How can that be seeing? Commentary Ananda reiterates the Buddha's example. The blind, a blind person has no use of his eyes and so sees only darkness. But according to Ananda, this seeing of darkness is not really seeing. Ananda is saying that someone without the use, the use of his eyes cannot see. Why do you say the blind man sees? He asked the, the Buddha. Sutra, the Buddha said to Ananda, is there any difference between the blackness seen by blind people who do not have the use of their eyes and the blackness seen by someone who has the use of his eyes when he is in the dark room? When he is in the dark room. Commentary Is the darkness that sighted people see when they are in a dark house that is without the light of sun, moon, or lamps any different? from the darkness seen by blind people. If a blind people and a person who has sight are together in a dark room, are the two blacks they see distinguishable? Sutra, so it is, world honored one. Between the two kinds of blackness that seen by the person in a dark room and that seen by the blind, there is no difference. Commentary, Ananda answers the world honored one's question. So it is, yes, Buddha. Between the two kinds of blackness that seen by the person in a dark room, by the sighted person, and that seen by the blind, there is no difference. The two kinds of blackness are the same. Fine, said the Buddha, yes. Sutra Ananda, if the person without the use of his eyes, who sees only blackness, will suddenly to regain his sight and see all kinds of forms, and you say it is his eyes which see. Then when the person in a dark room who sees only blackness 
Suddenly, sees all kinds of forms because of a lamp is lit. You should say it is the lamp which sees. Commentary: The Buddha said to Ananda, Ananda, if the person without the use of his eyes, who sees only blackness, were suddenly to regain his eye, his sight, and see all kinds of forms, you say that there is no difference between the two kinds of blackness. But what if the blind person in our example were suddenly to regain his sight, so that his eyes could see everything in every direction? You say it is his eyes which see. This is your argument. But what about the case when the person in the dark room, who sees only blackness, suddenly sees all kinds of forms because of because the lamp is lit? The sighted person in the dark room also sees blackness, but once the lamp is lit. He too can see everything. Given your argument, you should say it is the lamp which sees. Why does the Buddha say that? People in the dark room cannot see, but when a lamp is lit, they can see. People who don't have the use of their eyes cannot see, but if they regain their sight, then they can see again. If, when that person who cannot see suddenly sees because he regains his his sight. Then, when the person in the dark room sees because of the lamp, that should be called the lamp's seeing. Is that right? The Buddha asks. Sutra: If it is a case of lamp of the lamp seeing, it would be a lamp endowed with sight, which couldn't be called a lamp. And if the lamp were to do the seeing, how would you be involved? Commentary: If it really were the case that the lamp could see and do the looking, then it wouldn't have anything to do with you. Sutra. Therefore, you should know that why the lamp can reveal the forms, it is the eyes, not the lamp, that do the seeing. And why the eyes can reveal the forms, the seeing nature comes from the mind, not the eyes. Commentary. Therefore, you should know that why the lamp can reveal the forms. It is the the eyes, not the lamp, that do the seeing. The lamp allows the shapes to appear, but it is the eyes that see the shapes. By the same token, why the eyes can reveal the forms and seeing nature comes from the mind, not the eyes. We are now looking into the first or the ten manifestations of seeing. The first of the ten shows the seeing of the mind. Not of the eyes. Sutra. Also, Ananda and everyone in the great assembly had heard what was said. Their minds had not yet understood, and so they remained silent, hoping to hear more of the gentle sounds of the Tathagata's teaching. They put their palms together, purified their minds. And stood waiting for the Tathagata's compassionate instruction. Commentary: Although Ananda and everyone in the great assembly had heard what was said, their minds had not yet understood, and so they remained silent. Ananda and everyone else there closed their mouths and didn't say anything. Why weren't they talking? They were thinking. Oh, my eyes can't see things. Oh, my mind sees. You may say that isn't true, but the Buddha has explained it this way. If you say it is true, why haven't I ever understood it to be this way before? That's what they were thinking, because they hadn't yet understood. Their minds had not yet opened and become enlightened. Hoping to hear more of the gentle sounds of the Tathagata's teaching, they were thinking. I hope the Buddha will have a compassionate heart. And talk to me. They put their palms together. Why did they put their palms together? It represents their single-mindedness. They were of one mind, not two. When your hands are apart, it is said, you have ten minds. And when your palms are together, it is said, you have one mind. Because when your palms go together, your mind comes together and becomes one. Purified their minds. Clear out your mind. Clear your heart. Don't put too much garbage in your head. Take the garbage that is in there and get rid of it. 
and stood waiting for the Tathagata's compassionate instruction. They stood waiting for the Buddha's compassionate words to help them understand better so they could become enlightened and not be so confused. Sutra, then the world honored one extended his tuba cotton webbed right hand, opened his five wheeled fingers, and told Ananda in the great assembly. When I first accomplished the way, I went to the deer park, and for the sake of Ya Nata Kaundinaya and all five of the visuals, as well as for you of the fourfold assembly, I said, It is because living beings are impacted by gas dust and affliction that they do not realize body or become a heart. At that time, what caused you? who have now realized the holy fruit to become enlightened. Commentary Then why those in the assembly stood waiting to receive the Buddha's compassionate teaching and transforming, the wound on earth one, Shakyamuni Buddha extended his tula cotton wet right, right hand, opened his five-wheeled fingers, only the Buddha's hand is the hallmark of the thousand spoked will. His hand is extremely soft, like the finest cotton, and it is webbed and luminous. He told Ananda and the Great Assembly, When I first accomplished the way, one evening, on the eighth day of the twelfth month, while sitting under the Bodhi tree, I saw a star and awakened to, the, to perfect the way. I went to the deer park. This is a vast park devoted exclusively to raised deer. How did that come about? It all began limitless compass ago when Shakyamuni Buddha was a deer, the leader of a herd of 500. And guess who else was there? Devadatta, who was also a deer king with a following of 500 deer. In the later life, when the Buddha realized Buddhahood, Devadatta became the Buddha's jealous cousin and tried to kill him. But in that earlier life, when both were dear kings, there was a king among the people who used a lot of manpower and machinery to corral vast numbers of white animals into a certain area. He planned to hunt them all down and kill them on the grounds that there were too many white animals. So when Shakyamuni Buddha, in the form he had taken of the dear king, had a meeting with the dear king Devadatta, they said to each other, We should save the lives of our retinue. We shouldn't let the king kill us all. How can we save ourselves? Let's go talk it over with the king and petition him not to kill us off. Although they were dear, they could speak the language of people. So the two deer went to see the king, and when they encountered the armed guard at the gates, they said in a commanding tone, We would like an, an appointment with the king. Can you deliver our message? When the guard heard that the deer could speak the human language, he went to repeat their message to the king. The king also found it strange to hear that deer could talk and he agreed to an audience with them so they could state their petition. The two deer kings went before the king and said, We are deer. Every day you kill seven or eight of us more than you can possibly eat in a single day. What cannot be eaten is left to spoil. Wouldn't it be better if we did it this way? Every day we will take turns supplying you with one deer, and in that way, you can have fresh venison every day without killing us all off at once. If you use this method, your supply of venison will never run out. Several hundred years from now, there will still be venison to eat. Because he saw the sense of their petition and because the deer could speak, the king was moved to grant their request, so each of the deer kings on alternate days sent the king a deer. Now one day it happened that it was the turn of a pregnant doe in Devadatta's herd to 
go sacrifice herself to the king. Her fawn was heavy in her belly and would probably be born in a day or so. So she pleaded with the dear king Devadatta, Can you send someone in my place today and then after the fawn, the fawn is born, I will go to the king and sacrifice myself? Devadatta replied, Impossible, it is your turn and you must go. There is no politeness in this matter. You don't want to die? Who does? Not one of the deer want to go to their death. You want to live a few more days now that has come around to your turn, but that is impossible. The pregnant doe's eyes brimmed with tears and she went to talk to the deer king who was to become Shakyamuni Buddha. Although she didn't belong to his herd, she went to plead him with him and asked if he could work out a temporary exchange so she could live a few more days until her fawn was born. As he considered her request, Shagumni Buddha realized that not one of his 500 deer would want to go in her place. However, the Buddha said to her, Fine, you stay in my herd. I don't need to go. You don't need to go. Then the dear king Shakyamuni Buddha went himself to be sacrificed in her place. The king asked him, What are you doing here? Have all your deer be eaten? Is your heart all gone? Why have you come? And since he could talk, the dear king Shakyamuni Buddha said, King, you haven't eaten all our deer. On the contrary, we are prospering. Day by day, our hearts are increasing. You only eat one deer a day, and in one day our, our does give birth to many fawns. The king said, Then why have you come yourself? Shakyamuni Buddha explained, There is a pregnant doe whose fawn will be born in a day or so. It was her turn to come today, but since she wanted to wait until she had given birth to her fawn before she came to let the king eat her. She came to me and pleaded to have someone send in her place. I thought over her request and realized that none of the deer in the herd would want to die before they had to. So I came myself to substitute for her. When the king heard that, he was profoundly moved and he said, From now on, don't send any more deer to the palace. Then he spoke of us. Draw a deer with a human head. I am a person with a deer's head. From this day forward, I will not eat the flesh of living beings. He said, Although you have the head of a deer, you are a human being, and although I have the head of a human being, I am a deer. And then he vowed never to eat the flesh of living beings again. Because of that, the deer population in the park increased significantly, and the park was called the Deer Wise Park. It was also named the Park of the Immortals because the wind of water, the geomantic lay of the land and its location, were particularly fine, and many immortals came there to cultivate the way. So when Shakyamuni Buddha became a Buddha, he went first to the Deer Wise Park to convert the five bishops.